the attention, uh, the acceptance that it's getting within the wider public, which is, I think, the main problem, there it will be relevant. And that's, I think, the place where we have to work more because that's, 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 that's the threat. The BDS, just as a small group, is less threatening than when it uh, has such a support or growing support by the liberal uh, center and left uh, of the society in Europe and in the US academia. Um, so, two last comments and uh, or questions, short, please. And uh, good evening. I would like to ask the moderator, the call now. Um, we are here at the Tel Aviv University, um, which receives funding from, from the Ministry of Defense. In this institute, for warmongers who actually drafted the Dahia Doctrine, the criminal Dahia Doctrine on the lands of the Palestinian village of Shachmunis. Uh, there are many other activities that the Tel Aviv, Uni that the Tel Aviv University, many other activities that the Tel Aviv University is complicit in, uh, which are in support of Israeli occupation and apartheid. Why shouldn't decent people around the world boycott this complicit Tel Aviv University? An answer, and with the last comment there. You could always start. I do. I have a short question. Uh, what would be, uh, what would you consider a legitimate non-violent opposition to occupation? Professor uh, Nelson, Professor Trump. I think, um, of course, I don't accept most of your. Uh, uh, sub uh, uh, assumptions. Um, I think um, that uh, we are living in a very complicated uh, place with uh, uh, um, two peoples that both have good claims. I, I don't think that the Palestinians don't have a, on, have a, on suffering or that there aren't real uh, problems with what's happening here. But I think that because it's so complex, it's very simplistic to put all the blame on one side. And I think that a lot of the blame is also on the other side. And under this complex situation where you have, where you have a conflict that there have been many attempts to solve, they haven't succeeded many times, not because of the Israeli side necessarily, also by, our, by the Palestinian side, both sides are to blame, let's take it. Um, in this context, I think you have to do the best you can. Unless, of course, you accept Judith Butler's uh, uh, suggestion, we can all pack our things and go back to wherever we came from. But if we're not going to do that, we have to acknowledge that by being there here, first of all, we have certain people that feel that they have been unjustly uprooted from their house from Sheikh Muniz. Yes. Okay, but does that mean that we have to now leave the whole country and get them back? I'm not so sure, especially since we also don't have where to go, and especially since we also have our rights and our claims. So now, one second. So now, in this complex situation, in this complex situation, we have to do our best. And our best is to comply by the rules, in my view. And I think our best, from the other side, is to try... By Israeli law and or international law? International law and Israeli okay. law. And it is very easy to say that everything is illegal, or that everything is corrupt, and everything is bad, I think that's both simplistic, both doesn't really, isn't really uh, the truth of it, and I think that doesn't contribute in any way to promoting peace, it just makes the extremists stronger on both sides. ...is a problem that the state of Israel is facing. However, there are two school of thoughts about how serious it is. Some people will say we have lived with uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, self-hated Jews all over, the, all over the years. And we have another phenomenon of it. Don't pay attention to them, uh, because by paying them attention, they are getting more, more voice. The other uh, school of thought is saying there is cancer here. You don't see it in the beginning. Uh, you don't see it when you look at the uh, balance of trade of Israel. It's going up with Europe in the last year, in the last 10 years. It's going up trillions. And if you look at the popularity of uh, Israel in the US, 60 to 10 stable years. 
60 for Israel, 10 for the Palestinians. Somebody say in the Senate, 100 to 0. So why worry? But you have to worry. Because uh, these people are doing a, a, a work that can undermine some a very important foundation of the state of Israel. And we should fight it. We should fight it. We have to first understand that there are two uh, motives behind the uh, BDS uh, uh, movement. One of them was demonstrated here. Until we leave the last point of Tel Aviv, they will continue to attack. These people should be comforted head in hand in all their lies, in all their uh, unproven, uh, uh, unproven arguments. Uh, we will let them speak because we are democracy and we are willing to listen. But then we battle them and this is an easy battle because their arguments are false and the truth is coming up at the end of the day. And the moral uh, ground is on our side. But there is another part of the BDS uh, movement which we have to pay attention to. And this is people who care, who care about justice, who care about what is the qualities of the state of Israel, who have an argument with us, maybe not with us, with the, with the government of Israel, about the policies that the government of Israel is conducting. This is a legitimate argument, a legitimate argument, and my uh, guideline to, to, to my uh, researchers is try to differentiate between the two. Because the first one that drives our nerve is easy to battle. The second one is much more difficult because then we come to the essence of this place, offering a policy, a better policy that will defeat the BDS by taking more of the argument away. And this is exactly what we are doing here. Uh, we have to pay attention to the fact that the formal BDS is failing. It's failing, they are not achieving anything. But there is hidden BDS that is not formal, that is not uh, announced in the, in the open and voting in some academics or some council. And this uh, BDS that was represented here by some of the, of the speakers, that people are not uh, told that they are not accepted to a seminar or are not promoted or are not getting the normal treatment, by, not by a direct uh, uh, approach, but by some hidden, and uh, this is the, the, the cancer that we are facing. We have to uh, put it up, we have to uh, treat it, and to, uh, and to get, uh, to, and to continue to, to cope with it. It will not disappear. It will not disappear immediately, even if we change our policies. Because you heard, people don't want us here in Tel Aviv. They don't want us anywhere. They don't put their attention to what's going on in some other places. Uh, I would uh, expect them to go and demonstrate against some other neighborhoods where 200,000 Syrians are killed. And I haven't seen any BDS movement against uh, Assad. Some of well, them are refugees from here, from Sheikh Mones. And yes, refugees, there are 9 million refugees in Syria. 6 million So, uh, we gave you the, the right to incite, we gave you the right to speak, and now you will listen. And I protect the right to speak. I think it gives us some food for thought. It challenges us. At the end of the day, it shows the, the nature of the movement. The nature of the movement. Um, last but not least, once again, uh, we will continue with the research. We will continue to help the wonderful uh, people who are doing the fight. And when I speak about existential threat to the state of Israel, uh, in the last two years when I'm lecturing, I say there is no existential threat to the state of Israel, a military one. Unless Iran will have the nuclear bomb, then it's another story. Israel is strong, Israel is powerful, and 
some existential threat may be not for military uh, threat, but from some soft power threat. And BDS is a soft power threat, if it will not be checked. Those who think that BDS is a real threat should create the organization to cope with it. The same that we, as we created the IDF. You need a strategy, you need tactics, you need to learn the arguments and to comfort them. You have to learn the organizations and to cope. And the leader of this organization should be in the uh, level of the chief of staff. And you should have a chief of staff based not on major generals, on professors for political science, on professors for history, uh, legal advisors, uh, ethics professors, uh, PR people, uh, journalists, and all of them together should create the strategy of the threat to cope with this threat, which today I don't see as a formidable one, but all the time we have to be aware, maybe something is boiling behind uh, the ground and will erupt one day and we have to be ready when it's erupted. Thank you very much.